If you didn't watch the recently completed Conservative Party leadership contest closely, well, you could be forgiven since it didn't end until 1.30 in the morning. But you may have missed one of the most interesting developments in recent memory in that party. A relatively unknown candidate and the first black woman ever to run for the head of that party went from relative obscurity to becoming a kind of star candidate. And while ultimately she didn't take the top job, it's clear she's got a real future in that party. She is Leslin Lewis, managing partner with Lewis Law, and she joins us now from Ajax, Ontario. Uh, Dr. Lewis, good to see you. How are you? I'm doing very well, Steve. Nice to be here. Not at all. I do want to start with the leadership election. It did go three ballots. Uh, no, you didn't win. But on the second ballot, you won the most number of votes. And let's just hammer this home for a second. You got more votes than Peter McKay, who's a former party leader and a senior cabinet minister in the Harper years. And you got more votes than the eventual winner, Aaron O'Toole. The most votes, but not the most points. It's a point system, and as a result, you had to drop off. But I am curious, when you heard you got more votes than either of those two other guys on that second ballot, what'd you think? Well, I knew that I put in the work. I knew that my strategy was to go out and sign up new conservatives because I wasn't certain how I would be received by the existing uh, party members, being that the two other candidates had more name recognition than I did. So I led a campaign that was deliberately focused on doing politics differently, and it was honest, it was clear, the messaging resonated with Canadians, and I believe that that is what ultimately led me to uh, be the uh, to win the the majority of votes. You know, a lot of people were taken aback by your success, and you obviously were not. What did they miss that you knew? Well, I knew that conservatives wanted to talk about conservative issues, and I knew that they didn't want to create a, another liberal party. And so I knew that the messaging was important, and I knew that a lot of conservatives were feeling very silenced um, and that they did not feel that their voices were being heard. And so I wanted to be that voice for those people who felt that they were disenfranchised somehow. We did point out you're the first black woman ever to contest the leadership of a conservative party. That's both the current incarnation, the previous incarnation, the progressive conservative party, all of the different ones as well. You're also the first black woman to contest a major party leadership in 45 years. Uh, Rosemary Brown, NDP, 1975 was the last time. And you did very well. What do you think that says, if anything, about the state of politics in general and conservative politics in particular today? Well, I think that people aren't really looking at what a person looks like. They're more looking at the content of their character. They're looking at their policies. They're looking at their ability to represent them, their educational background, and their skill sets. And so that's what I focused on. I just focused on the issues, on connecting with people on the ground, on listening to them, on making sure that my policies reflected their life experiences and their desires for this country. I don't deny any of that's true, but given the you know, social justice slash ra racial reckoning that's going on in North America right now, I wonder if you think part of the reason for your success is that your candidacy allowed conservatives to say, um, Look, we're, we're not racist, we're not like them, we're not what you thought we were. Look how well Leslin Lewis has done, after all. What do you think? Well, I just think it's really sad state of our country right now that we are so divided on issues of race. And when I traveled around the country, I went to, you know, places like Saskatchewan and I met with farmers and and people who, uh, you know, would have been labeled as racist, and those people embraced me. I've never felt so much love traveling around the country, and it's just so sad that I believe that politicians are sometimes using uh, polar, polarizing uh, subjects in order to divide us, and I think it's time that we put those things behind us, that we focus on issues that bind us together and that unite us as a country. Well, one of the uh, reasons you did so well is that you got a great deal of support from social conservatives, who are, of course, an important part of the big blue tent that the Conservative Party calls itself. Um, it's, I think it's fair to say that for whatever reason, conservatives have to deal with issues around social conservatism in a way that other political parties in this country don't have to. Do you think that they are somehow seen as uh, 
a kind of, you know, boogeyman of Canadian politics sometimes? Well, I'm certainly not a boogeyman, Steve. <laughs> um, and I think that I'm fairly representative of what a social conservative is. And I have social conservative values, but I really didn't define myself as that until I got into politics and people told me that that was how I was defined. And these values are just people who believe in the sanctity and the dignity of all human beings, the sanctity of human life, um, making sure that we uphold our democracy and that really governments stay out of our homes, that we're able to raise our children in accordance with our values and that governments are not intrusive and, and create alienation within parental relationships and within other relationships. Hmm. Uh, I, I normally don't on this program ask people personal questions uh, about their backgrounds, but you have been open and candid about your own personal circumstances, um, particularly as it relates to the issue of abortion, as to why you hold the views that you do. Now, for our viewers who don't know about that story, can you share it here? Sure. So I was a um, young woman articling, finished law school, and I was articling, and um, I was engaged to be married, and I got pregnant, and the timing was very off. And I had a lot of friends saying, you know, your articling year, that is a tough year. You're going to be working long hours on Bay Street, and it's just your career is going to really suffer if you have this baby. And so I had friends who even booked appointments for me to have an abortion. I seriously contemplated it because I was really concerned about my career. I was also concerned about working so hard my entire life and getting a job on Bay Street and then walking around pregnant. And I can honestly tell you that there was a sense of shame that I felt um, on these big Bay Street firm with this great opportunity and ending up pregnant. But I decided that I was going to have the baby and we got married and um, we had the baby and she's, she's a beautiful 22 year old today. So I understand the pressures that women feel in having an abortion. I think it's one of the uh, toughest decisions that a woman has to make. One in three women go through that and do have abortions. And so I feel it's very important that we don't demonize women and that we work together on, in understanding each other and that we don't allow politics to polarize us as women. I understand. Th this is a, um, a tricky issue, obviously, for numerous reasons, but in, in particular, the politics that come to it. And I just want to share a poll here commissioned by the National Post which shows that 71% of Canadians say a woman should be able to get an abortion if she decides she wants to, no matter the reason. And 70% of Canadians say the current situation regarding abortion with no legal restriction at any stage of pregnancy is acceptable. 16% of Ontarians say they are pro-life. 58% say they are so-called pro-choice. Um, okay, so you, you know and I'm not saying public opinion has to carry the day on this, but you do understand that your views are in the distinct minority in this country. Fair to say? That's fair to say, but if, if I have a belief, I believe that, you know, we live in a de democratic society, and so it doesn't matter. It, even if my views are 1%, it's a dem I'm entitled to my beliefs. I am running as a politician, so I crafted policies that unify Canadians and the policies that I have focused on life issues are issues that deal with misogyny, that deal with um, targeting uh, a female in the womb because it is a female, on forcing women to have abortions, on making sure that women have the supports that they need through pregnancy care centers, and making sure also that we're not calling, um, imposing our colonialist views on uh, you know, countries in Africa by funding overseas abortion with taxpayer dollars that they don't care to have funding for. So those are the policies that I put forth. And the sanctity of life issue is something that's important to me because as a black person, there was a, there was a time in history where I was not considered a person. And so it, I think that people have fought for what they believe in. And there's nothing wrong with me having the belief that I believe that the um, that preborn life is valuable. I believe that end of life is also valuable. And for those who do not share my beliefs, that's okay. We can have differing opinions in a free and democratic society. In fact, in that same poll, 84% of those surveyed said it should be illegal to have an abortion because 
the baby is of a certain sex. So you are with the strong majority of people uh, when it comes to that question. I guess the only reason I raise this is because, you know, it's not impossible to imagine that at some point uh, the conservatives will be back in power. You might be in the cabinet. Who knows? You might be the health minister. And people who are watching this right now, as they consider their next choices at election time, will want to know, does Leslie Lewis want to recriminalize abortion in Canada? Because those are her personal views. What's the answer? Well, you know, I've always been able to sit across the table from people who don't share my views. And I think as a professional, you have to make sure that you represent your clients. And my clients, as a politician, will be my constituents. And so it is important that you respect democracy, that you allow other people people's opinions to be voiced, and that we talk about these very, very difficult issues. I don't think that we should run away from issues or that we should silence people. I think that we should continue to talk about it and, and work towards changing hearts and minds if that is something that, that the public is, is interested in. So I will uphold whatever the, the public um, deems that they, they believe should be the law in a free and democratic society, but that doesn't change the fact that I have personal opinions um, which I believe that I'm entitled to, and I'm also entitled to vote in accordance with my conscience. Aaron O'Toole was on this program last Friday. I asked him this question, so I'm going to ask you the same one. There are some people in this country today who believe Canada is built on white supremacy. Do you agree? Well, you know, there's no perfect society, Steve. I don't think that you can find a society where there isn't discriminatory policies or discrimination doesn't exist. But what I think is important is that we find policies that unify us. I think that we look at imperfections in our system and we work at building them. I don't subscribe to the notion that we should destroy our systems because they are imperfect. I think that we should work together as Canadians to improving things such as policing, improving the system, and working for better outcomes. Do you support the aspirations of Black Lives Matter? Well, Black Lives Matter is a very controversial issue because while I do support the fact that people should protest for things that they believe in in a free and democratic society, there are many aspects of Black Lives Matter that I don't support. I don't support defunding the police because I believe that minority communities and lower income communities are disproportionately affected when there is an underfunding of police services. I also don't support Black Lives Matter um, notion that we should destabilize the traditional nuclear family. So those aspects of the movement I don't support. I also don't support any form of protest that does not embody peaceful protest. And so the riots that I've seen, I'm strongly opposed to them. And I want to make sure that we work as a society for the betterment of all Canadians. We had uh, several months ago on this program a woman by the name of Kika Oja Thompson on. She's an equity consultant, and she had this to say about anti-black racism at that time. We're going to play this clip, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. The two biggest cities in the province of Ontario, Toronto and Ottawa, both have black male police chiefs. Um, what does that say to you? It says that um, that 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 racism, that that anti-blackness in particular is so insidious and so profound and so pervasive that in order to become the leader of anything of, of, of consequence in this, in this province, in this country, frankly, um, you have to be able to perform whiteness at a level so supreme uh, that, that it rivals some white men, straight white Christian men. Um, you know, and that, that is a requirement of holding these positions. Dr. Lewis, what do you think of this notion that for blacks to succeed in this country, they've got to quote unquote perform whiteness? Well, I'm I'm not really concerned with um, you know notions that attempt to polarize and divide us. I think that what we need to do is we need to look beyond things that divide us. We need to work towards making sure that we create an equal society for all Canadians. And I think that we, we need to focus more on improving institutions to make sure that all Canadians can thrive and prosper in them. You know, I do note in the last uh, Conservative leadership campaign, the uh, Association of Black Conservatives endorsed Aaron O'Toole. They didn't endorse you. Were you miffed about that? Not 
really. I think that they felt that they wanted to go for somebody that could deliver an opportunity to them. And everybody thought that I had no chance of winning. Um, nobody knew that I would win the popular vote. Um, even afterwards, many uh, reporters wrote to me privately to say, you know what, we're sorry. We underestimated you. We didn't give you a chance. We didn't think that that you uh, would win. And uh, Association of Black Conservatives are a product of this system too also. So they may have bought into the notion that I could not win. Fortunately, people all over rural Canada, in Saskatchewan, places like that, they looked more at my values. They looked more at my policies. They looked at how I had policies that unify Canadians and not more, not uh, specifically at what I can do for them as individuals, but what I could do for them as a country. And so I was glad to have the support of people like in Saskatchewan, in rural Alberta, all over the West that put me as number one and, and throughout the rest of Canada. Uh, Dr. Lewis, people call you Dr. Lewis because you got a PhD in international law, uh, but I notice as well you've got a master's in environmental science, so I want to ask you a question about the environment. Uh, you only have to look at the uh, west coast of the United States right now to see that uh, much of it is on fire. Climate change, we're not talking about it enough, obviously because of the pandemic, but um, I think it's fair to say that uh, certainly in the last federal election, your party didn't do very well in parts of this country, in part because it was perceived as having nothing to say of relevance about the environment. And I want to know you, as somebody who obviously cared enough about the environment to get a master's degree in it, what are you going to do about that? Well, I don't know, Steve, that it's fair to say that my party didn't have anything of relevance to say about the environment. They did. I, they had uh, quite a bit to say, but I think that it was in the delivery. I think what we need to do is have a simplified environmental policy that deals with uh, people making differences in their lives that will positively impact on the environment. I think we also need to incentivize businesses to find solutions to making sure that we are doing all business in an environmentally friendly manner. And finally, I think that we need widespread education policies to invest in education initiatives so that people understand and how to conserve, how to impact the environment. And, and we need to do so in a way that, that's not just imposing taxes on individuals, but making real substantive changes. Would you say, though, it's fair to say that uh, in this country at the moment, most people, when they think of the party that has something relevant to say about the environment, the Conservative Party is not the first party that comes to mind? That would be unfortunate because I believe that we do have strong environmental policies. As I said, I think that our delivery has to be a little bit different and that we have to focus on making sure that people understand that we, we value the environment and that although we value things like developing our natural resources, that we can do that in an environmentally friendly manner and that our environmental record is one of the best in the world. Okay, in our last minute here, uh, I do want to point out that you uh, announced just yesterday that uh, you intend, I know they want you in Alberta, but you're not going to run in Alberta, actually, in the next federal election. You've decided to run here in the province of Ontario, in southwestern Ontario, in the riding of Haldeman, Norfolk. Why did you pick that riding? Well, for a similar reason why I was contemplating Alberta and contemplating Sask Saskatchewan, I've had implications for many ridings to potentially join their riding and I picked Haldeman Norfolk because I over my travels I was very disturbed by how much our government has abandoned farmers and the rural community and so I wanted to be a strong voice I also wanted to continue the legacy of the Honorable uh, Finley uh, MP Finley and I feel that you know that riding would afford me all of those opportunities in addition to the fact that it is close to where my children grew up and they can still maintain close relations with their childhood friends. Now you're in Ajax right now. The last time you ran in an election, you ran in Scarborough. Do you have any particular connection to that riding? Well, I I won the I won the vote in 
in Holden and Norfolk. I, I came first in that riding in the leadership race. I received more votes than all of the other uh, contestants combined. And so there, there seems to be a deep connection with that riding on, on issues of values. And I understand the issues. I understand the values that are important to that riding. And I believe I will be a very good representative and follow in MP Finley's footsteps. No, I get that. It's just that it, it is one of the safest conservative seats in Ontario. And I think uh, some conservative supporters were hoping that you would use your uh, newfound popularity and currency to seek a, um, well, how, how about to run in a more challenging seat where you could lead a conservative renewal in a part of the province that isn't traditionally thought of as being conservative at the moment? Did you consider that? Well, I, I was more concerned about the treatment of rural Canadians and how they embraced me. And so really and truly what I was thinking of is, is finding a rural riding um, where I connected immediately with the people. And so my decision was with rural Ontario or Saskatchewan or Alberta. Those were the areas that I was considering, and I chose the one that was best for my family. Gotcha. Well, we appreciate you spending so much time with us on TVO tonight. I hope this will be the first of many conversations we have on the air. And uh, good luck with your political career going forward. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.